experience. Um, basically, when you look actually into the market, and this is for sure what we are also doing, um, and to, to look which kind of um, solutions exist uh, in terms of bone grafting, then we know all particles and we know pre shaped blocks and you know denting screw techniques and, and more and more things. But here's a growing segment, and at least I call it customized bone grafting and techniques. And we have some market players here. And some of you sure, uh, surely know the Bone Easy company from Rui. So this is a nice customized titanium mesh. Rui is actually able to deliver to the market. There are some more market players also here. We can mention them. Um, BTK implants from Italy, an example, or also Geistlich, the mesh here on the lower left, um, is uh, was entering the market, I think, three years back now, 2016, 17, something like that. Here in the middle is a very nice um, picture of a customized zirconia yeah, plate or shell um, from the uh, article which uh, is cited on the bottom of the, of the slide. So this is the market segment which is growing. Um, and um, for sure, I mean, the main purpose is to reduce surgery time, to, to support, um, to reduce the morbidity. And um, yeah, have a better fit, a better adaptation uh, um, of the bone graft um, to the surgical site, which hopefully improves the very vascularization. So when you look into the allograft block technique, then it's also belong have been introduced in back to the 1950s, the first article. Uh, I was able to download and read was an article from Converse who was using Kadama bone to um, to graft the, in this case the mandible. You can see it um, many 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 years later. Um, 2005, Michele Giacotti, he just uh, developed a technique. I show you some slides later how to pre-shake blocks on stereolithographic models prior to the surgery. So and then during the surgery, his more or less pre-shaped blocks. Fit um, perfectly to the, the the defect site, and he was much quicker, uh, and the surgery went much much quicker than um, shaping the uh, blocks at chair site. And then later on, 2012, the customized blocks have been uh, developed and later on uh, introduced into the market. So um, the tissue processing. When we talk about allograft, then we should also be Talk a little bit about processing because there are different kinds of allograft options in the market. So fresh frozen bone, which is normally not processed, not stabilized, then we have to process bone. And I just want to share a couple of slides how important processing can be. Um, this is a, a process we are using in our um, facility, in our company, to um, clean and sterilize. Um, the bone. So after a donor selection, so we are talking mostly about cadaver bone, the donor selection criteria are according to the EU tissue directives. You can find them here. So the European Union um, released the kind of um, safety standard directive how um, tissue banks have to process, have to screen donor, which quality management system they need, uh, traceability, and, and so on. So this is all regulated by the EU government. Finally, then, um, the manufacturers, the tissue banks can be a little bit creative um, how they treat the bone. Um, so we do it in uh, multiple steps. We remove the fatty tissue. We put the blocks uh, or the bone in a, in a kind of osmotic solution to break down uh, cell uh, membranes and to wash out all the genetic material. Then later on, we bleach the bone with hydrogen peroxide, so which also kills prions, bacteria, and viruses. And later on, we take out the water, we do a solvent dehydration before we put the block into um, for gamma irradiation. So this process, just one, two comments about that. It's a process which takes 40 days. It's a long time. It's a gentle process. And it's a process carried out at room temperature. So there's no heat treatment step which is um, which is the most important um, fact here because when you look into xenograft materials, those are normally heat treated to remove the organic component 
um, what we do, what most of the allograft um, tissue banks uh, are doing is to maintain also the organic component. And this is basically also the key when we're talking about um, blocks or, or, or bowels or pre-shaped blocks. So this is how it looks like. This is a processed and, and clean bone which has been sterilized. You can see on the left side the nice porosity we also need to support um, yeah, bone formation and also revascularization. In higher magnification, um, you see on the left side that the bone contains collagen. So, and here you can see um, how the how the material after processing um, looks like. So we have almost 60% bone mineral, which which we are used to have when we are talking about bone grafting materials. But we also have almost 35% of collagen, and this collagen gives us the flexibility and also stability, which makes it possible to mill to shape that type of bone. Um, you probably never saw a xenograft bone block in the market. There are only just a few companies offering such bone blocks because once they are removing the collagen, you just have finally the mineral component, which is very brittle and very hard to shape and fix. The collagen here is the key and um, provides the mechanical properties we need during a milling uh, process. Um, so different, different um, shapes we can realize so cube um, cubit uh, um, um, shapes or also the bowels in the middle so those are, are, are materials you can have uh, from the shelf so and and you need to shape chair side and how this looks like just one one case about that here is the central incisor are missing we have this huge horizontal um, deficiency and by using a, a, a a pre-shaped block, it's not a customized, it's just pre-shaped, so this needs to also additionally shape chair side to have the best fit, um, probably the best fit you can you can achieve, then fix it with uh, two screws. Um, you need to cover with a membrane, this is the recommendation, so I just skip this uh, picture here and this slide here, but basically after six months healing time, this is the result, and then you look at the um, fixation screws, they are inside contact with the surface, which shows us um, only minimal or almost no resorption or shrinkage during heating time of six months. Very important, let it heal for six months. Allograft blocks are, are lazy. They need more time than autogenous bone blocks. So you really should wait six months before placing the implant. After taking out the screws and placing the implant, and um, when we look into the seven-year follow-up picture here, this is a nice case you see on the right side, almost a buckle plate around 1.8 millimeters thickness um, and the crystal bone levels are also very well maintained. So this is a very nice case seven year follow up after allograft bone block grafting with a pre-shaped block non-customized. From a histological point of view, this is six months after placing the block. So before um, placing the implant, we took this um, biopsy, and you can see on the left side, um, here is old bones, is still the allograft bone with the empty osteocyte uh, lacuna. Then we have the new bone on top. This is more red here, um, turning a little bit into purple. And there we have some osteocytes already um, in, the, in the bone. And then we have the, the osteoblast, which, which, um, yeah, which um, forming more new bone. And then it's the same sample, just a different location. You can also see osteo, osteoclasts, which are able to resorb the allograft bone. This is how it works. So this product, all allograft bone products in the market are just um, having a temporary function. They have the body for a couple of months, depends a little bit on the product itself, but the osteoclasts are able to resorb it. So we have an active resorption and an active new bone formation. Um, just a little bit science behind when you look into some head-to-head um, -head studies comparing autogenous bone blocks with uh, allograft bone blocks. So what you normally do is to look into histology after a couple of months healing time. And here the yellow bar shows us for the autogenous bone block group almost 32 versus 31% of new bone formation. And for sure, after six months healing time, 
Mesa, the untouchable block, nor the allograft block have been remodeled completely. So we have some residual bone graft, bone block and material um, still at the at the defect site, which will be remodeled and removed later on. But here, from a, also from histological point of view, the results are very nice. And we have also some uh, meta analysis and, and review um, articles available comparing implant survival also success rate when implants have been placed in a touch or so allograft block. You can see that a, a certain variety here from 70 to 100 or 90 to 100 percent, but basically the results are very, very comparable. And um, also from a from a aesthetic point of view, this was a study um, just um, assessed the pink aesthetic score after patients have been grafted with autogenous and allograft bone blocks. And you can see here just a uh, pink aesthetic score was 7.5 plus minus 2.6 without differences between uh, autogenous um, and um, allograft bone block group, um, which is also a very nice result, not only to look into histology, also to, to look into the aesthetic uh, results. Last, uh, finally, you know, pre-shaping or shaping the blocks just like that takes time and you will never have a perfect fit. This is what we know. Um, and so Michele Giacotti back in 2005, and this is a very nice book and it's, it's hard to get, but at least I have a copy. So he developed a technique and also pub published it later in the uh, Jomi journal, uh, 3D block technique. And his idea was just based on a CT scan. Um, and back to 2005, almost 15 years back, Based on a CT scan, he sent the CT scan to at this time materialized company and they printed a sterile um, stereolithographic model of the defect site. You can see the, the, white, um, the white template here, the stereolithographic model of the maxilla. So, and, and um, Dr. Chakotti just took the bone blocks and before just elevating the flap um, um, to assess the, the defect site, he pre shaped the blocks on this model, on the stereolithographic model. And later on, he took the pre-shaped adapted blocks and put them into the uh, patient mouth at the defect site, which, uh, which again was much quicker and reduced the uh, surgical time, chart time, as well as mobility for the patient. And probably the fit was much better than when you're just um, in, in a hurry and doing the surgery and you need to shape five blocks. Um, probably the fit is not as good. And you just take a moment um, before you open and elevate the flap. Um, the customized allograft blocks, this is now the full digital way, um, the full digital way, um, which is also based on CT or cone beam CT scans. So, I mean, the, it's, it's nothing special, no special um, scan on it. It's, um, if you go, we are mostly work with a slight thickness of 0 0.2 to 0 0.3. Six millimeters, so we do not need a very high resolution scans. For sure, we need to work with DICOM files. Um, then, how it works from a from a um, technical point of view. So, I mean, you just need to transfer the DICOM to us. Um, we can use, I see it in the chat, we can use Slicer, so we don't use Slicer, which is a software, but we need to segment. The, the DICOM file, which means we do the segmentation and extract the bony surface. So this is normally done um, with a so-called threshold function. So we define just the gray values of the bone. So when we are working with CT scans, this is much easier than this cone beam CD. But um, this is how it looks like. So we, we just, you see the green color here. Um, that means that we um, be using automatic segmentation algorithm who detects the bony surface, and later on we can calculate uh, the surface. So what we are doing here, we are um, um, having a SDL model of the bone, and you can see that uh, the issue here, we have um, a nice vertical bone, but a very thin ridge, so we need a horizontal a bone block on top of that. So just one, one uh, picture here, how, how it can look like, and we look from, the, from more um, um, Apical, uh, not apical, coronal aspect, then you can see that uh, we increase the ridge this by a couple of millimeters. I'm not going too much in detail here how we do it, but I mean, there's also nothing to hide, so you can also check the article which I cited 
um, on this slide. Um, finally, um, once we designed the block, it's also an SDL file, so we sent it to a milling machine, and this is how a, a processed and sterilized um, allografted bone block looks like. It's very clean, so um, there's no marrow inside anymore. So we put it on the milling machine, and we are able to, to mill the block out of a, of a um, human um, donated bone. Um, and so we are, with this technology, it's not only to, to work on, on huge, big block grafts like, like here, where we can uh, almost graft half of the, of the um, maxilla. So it's, it's not about size, it's more about complexity. Um, when you look into a case like that, which is probably not as big, but it's a center incisor, you have a bucket defect, you have a palatal defect, so you have this typical J graft. And it's also pretty hard to shape chair side. Maybe there are different techniques which you can now also um, have in mind here, place implant immediately to some GBR with a, with a reinforced membrane. There are many different ways how to do it, but finally this shows how, how um, complex also milled bone blocks can look like. And we are also able to uh, deliver and smaller um, and not only big uh, bone blocks. So in, in more advanced cases like that, when we have a dentalist patient, um, then it also makes sense to have a close interaction with you. So um, you, you see here we have 3.4 or 2.80 uh, millimeter of uh, rich width, so we need to increase again um, the horizontal dimension, but we do not have any idea where the implants will be placed later. So whenever possible, uh, we should also um, work with with, with, with you, that you let us know where the implants will be placed, and there is software available. You you are able to export also the implant position as the SDL file, so we can then take the the ideal implant position. We can uh, superimpose it with our uh, segmented uh, bone SDL, also with the bone block planning. So and this is how it looks like finally. So you can see on the left side we did a good job. So the implant is probably uh, covered by by the bone block here in orange. Um, totally, but on the right side, um, in the lateral incisor on the on the left side, um, you can see that the bone, the implant is probably not covered by bone. So this wouldn't, will never happen when we have the uh, when we have the exact when we when you are able to deliver us the, the ideal implant position, then we can adapt the bone block much nicer, and there will won't be any surprises later on um, once. Um, the, the implants will be placed. So this is what we, we should do for, for challenging cases, always um, work also with the ideal implant position. How good does it fit? I mean, this is the most important question, I think, when we're talking about bone blocks like that. And I think it's a nice case here to demonstrate um, what we can do. I mean, it's a, it was a maxilla and we needed almost three bone blocks. So, but I mean, then I have been asked, okay, can you do one block on this side? So can we bridge here the canine just on the buckle side? And then you can you design just one bone block? I do not want to place one block here on the lateral incisor and then a second one more posterior area. And I said, okay, let's do it. And also on the on the right side here, it's just a block, a horizontal block, so without any um, tooth or teeth which are still in place. But finally, once we designed the block, and here you can see a um, picture from the surgery on the right maxilla, um, it's a very nice fit. You know, those blocks are cancellous bone. You can see how quick the, the, the blood goes in and fix this three screws, but you do not see any gap in between here. And then you go to the, then we go to the left side where we just um, also grafted the, the, the canine here on the, on the buckle on the buckle side. You can also see we already placed it in, in the screw here on the distal aspect, and we just need one more screw on the medial aspect. But the fit is also very nice. It looks very nice, and but this I I will show you also later. This depends also on the quality of the CT or called beam CT scan. Uh, at least in this um, particular case. Um, the quality was good, and also the design and later on the fit of the block um, more than more than um, good. 
just three cases to show um, you also a little bit not only the technique, also follow up. Um, so one case here and the uh, right mandible posterior defect. You can see a horizontal and vertical deficiency. Um, so we we designed um, a block to increase both uh, dimensions horizontally and vertically. So finally, this is how it looks like into a kind of radiograph. So we can also superimpose the scan, uh, the CT scan with, a, with the design bone block. You can see the yellow contour here. So we are able to increase the, the height maybe by three to four millimeters. Um, I'm not showing you the pictures from the surgery. I just want to focus on the one year follow up. You can see it's, this is a one year follow up and let's go from left to, to right. Um, so we have um, the, the, the second uh, molar on the right mandible here. The implant has been placed. Um, it's not fully restored actually. And this is the one year follow up CT scan. So implant is, is, uh, is placed. We have nice buckle bone. We have almost vertical bone up to the implant shoulder as, as, as long as we can uh, detect the implant shoulder here. So what I did here in the middle, you can see that the blue the blue um, contour here. This is the initial scan before grafting. This is baseline. And you can see from baseline, we increased the vertical, um, um, we, we had a lot of vertical gain as well as horizontal gain. And you can clearly see what we grafted, what at least the clinician has, uh, able to, has been able to achieve. But on the right picture, I also superimpose the initial block we designed. Yeah, the, green, the green contour is the design bone block because this provides us now the information. Okay, our, our goal was to probably achieve 4.8 millimeter in height. This was how we designed the bone block. But then we measure now from the, from the implant shoulder down to the uh, baseline defect, then probably we gained only 3.9 and not 4.8. So we lost a millimeter. And it's almost the same in the horizontal um, aspect here. So we lost a little bit of horizontal bone, but still the implant is covered um, is covered by um, plenty of bone and buckety. And it's the same when we go to implant uh, position. Um, oh, sorry, this was the first molar. This is the second molar. So more or less the same. One your follow-up scan shows a lot of um, a lot of new bone around the implant, and you superimpose again the initial scan. Um, you can see what we achieved here: almost five millimeters um, vertical gain, uh, vertical gain, and also horizontal gain. And at this point, at this second molar, when you look into the green um, contour here, this is again the, the block um, we designed. So we almost lost nothing knees uh, horizontally nor vertically. So this is one year follow up picture without implant loading. Um, um, I think a very, very good result. Um, one more case, two year follow up. Um, again, a right mandible, most cases, why ever, are, um, are in the mandible, posterior mandible. And so after implant removal, a um, couple of months healing time, um, a block has been designed also like that to gain um, bone in uh, vertical and horizontal dimension. And just to let you know, I mean, from uh, top to the bottom, this was almost eight millimeter in uh, vertical uh, dimension. I know normally a lot of questions will be asked about soft tissue grafting, how to cover the block, um, how, to, how to achieve a primary um, tension-free closure. So again, I'm not the dentist, at least I know technologies, and I, I'm also joining a lot of surgeries. And, um, but we can talk here about um, the brushing technique, or we, we can also look into Istan Urban, and then he's also elevating the flap on the lingual side. So there are techniques available. Um, to, to achieve also the soft tissue um, primary closure you need. Finally, um, this is how the block looks like. It was, was pretty big, almost four centimeters um, big. And after placing the block, and sorry for the quality of the, of the, of the picture here, I just uh, took it out from a video. 
but at least you can see also a, a good fit on the meso aspect as well as on the distal aspect so the block did uh, fit very well look at the screws it's important when we check the next picture <clears throat> after six months healing time so the screws are um, they are placed a little bit sub subcrestal um, and but are in tight contact with, with the bone block surface um, six uh, well okay this is a post uh, post of radiograph um, block fixed with two screws and six months later um, a second a second cone beam CT scan just to plan uh, the, the ideal implant positions but here you can see especially in the middle on the right side again the screw both screws are in, again tight very tight contact to the bone block so which tells us almost no resorption um, um, or minimal resorption but you can also see that um, the mineralization is, is not really done so there's the um, different uh, different bone densities when you look into the, the old cortical uh, bone here from the mandible and the newly formed bone. So this is ongoing um, bone formation and also maturation. Um, the re-entry also, also extracted from the video, so the poor quality. Um, um, that's the reason for the poor quality. But look at the, the screws again in tight context of so what we already saw on the uh, on the CT uh, comb beam CT scan. We now can also see your clinically almost no resorption, nice integration, very nice integration, and almost. I mean, this has been a cancerous bone block, but we can see that the surface is is not super dense, but at least the pores are closed. So we have a formation of a cortical of a cortical layer, cortical bone, which um, for sure will be um, continue this kind of cortical bone formation. Implants have been placed, so good news is that also um, stroma and bone level implants working very well in some of dental bone blocks. So this is not contraindicated. And after two years, I think we can see the result here. Implants are in function. Okay, we, we need to be also um, agree that we lost maybe one, one and a half millimeter here. Uh, implants have been placed probably a little bit deeper. And then this is an interesting finding here. The distal, uh, distal aspect of the of the implant here at position um, of the, the first uh, molar position shows a, a little bit of um, um, gap here between implant shoulder and bone. So we need to look into this, but finally, um, actually, the patient is still happy, and implants are working very well in function. Five-year follow-up case, and. and I'm sorry, but it's again uh, a mandible, and it's again on the right side. It's just by by surprise. It's not on purpose. Um, similar case with a vertical and horizontal uh, deficiency. Just please have a look here on the on the picture on the lower right. So we designed the block at this time, which goes very very far to the lingual aspect. So um, this was requested by the clinician at this time. It's important to um, to uh, note because um, during the surgery, this is how the block looked like, very big block. Um, here's the surgical site, block already has been placed and you can see on the lingual aspect, so this, this um, most of the lingual aspect of the bone block has been removed once the block has been placed. I can't tell you why, I did talk to the clinician and I said, listen, five years back, you removed um, the lingual uh, most of the lingual aspect of the bone block. Why, why, why did you do so? And he said, I can't remember anymore. Probably I, he wasn't able to close the flap, but he, at least it has been removed, um, covered with a membrane and then closed the flap. And here we did the same exercise. What you see here is a post-grafting beam CT scan. And you are already see here the gap on the lingual side. This, this is the material, the bone block material, which has been removed before closing the flap. Um, so, and this was the initial planning. So what we did, um, much wider blocks going to the lingual aspect, but again, this has been removed. It's important when you look into the five-year five -year follow-up picture. That's why I want to show you here that um, we did not lose the, the lingual, um, the bone volume on the lingual side later. So this has been removed during surgery. Um, same here for the um, 
soft molar um, block has been fixed this is post grafting scan and also most of the lingual um, bone has been bone block has been removed so now five uh, six months later um, post grafting so um, just um, doing um, the entry looks very nice bleeding bone also the screws again very tight contact to the bone block we can also claim here almost no resorption or very less resorption um, this is how it looks like and then finally two implants have been placed and you can see it almost here I hope you can see it I see it very well on my screen that the implant and now at least here the, the, the second um, molar implant is lingually not covered by bone because the bone um, had been removed before but the result is very nice um, again five-year follow-up scan on the left side which shows us almost 2.2 up to 1.8 millimeter of thick buckle plate um, in the middle you can see again the, the initial scan so we superimposed the baseline scan again so we increased bone vertically and horizontally but what we what we designed when we superimposed also the block is that we expected to have a much much thicker buckle plate and now after five years what we see is that the buckle plate is 2.2 up to 1.8 millimeter thick and so we lost most of the grafted bone on the buckle aspect and this is when when I saw the five-year post uh, follow-up scan it was quite clear because when you look from the apical aspect and you're going here to the coronal aspect of the of the ridge so what we did we designed the block um, away from the from the envelope so we overbuilt the block it's not much much nice um, uh, much much uh, too much bone or to the to the horizontal aspect and this has been uh, has been just resolved because um, yeah for, it's just biology so you cannot overbuild um, too much because um, unless the bone is not loaded and not needed then it will be remodeled or resolved and it looked much better on the second uh, on the first um, first um, molar uh, implant at site uh, four six so again five year follow up or four point five year follow up scan almost two millimeter thick buckle plate um, again here the initial um, scan you can see we increased both dimensions and here at this time we did not move so far out of the so far away from the envelope so we followed more or less the anatomical contour of the of the ridge and that's why we did not lose any uh, any kind of horizontal uh, horizontal uh, bone or, or buckle plate um, over there so this result is uh, much better at least on the on the buckle aspect but here on the lingual side uh, again um, because of the reason that this um, that this part of the bone has, has been removed at during the surgery we we see a kind of maybe not deficiency but at least this is not what we planned to achieve um, what else I mean most of the blocks um, will be designed as on-lay graft we have some very special cases um, very special cases and, and the Rui has more such cases and, and um, we, we all see it on LinkedIn and Rui is sharing uh, again one of his, his very nice cases this is what the soldier has been sent to a hospital in Germany and it was a gunshot who's already destroyed most of the sinus cavity the lateral wall here so and um, just the, the surgeon just called us and said um, I need a big huge bone block not only to increase here the, the height of the ridge also um, I showed it to you here also to yeah to rebuild kind of lateral uh, sinus wall so we, we designed the block and um, as, as long as I know as far as I know everything went very well so we can do again it's not the aim to to work on um, large blocks but it's the complexity you can see what we also can achieve with a, with a milled um, allograft block um, 
in this case. And then I saw this case, I said, oh yeah, well, this is a typical case. We are talking about the two bone blocks in the mandible on the left and the right side. And I was starting to design the blocks and then the customer called me and said, no, this is a special case. I do not need the blocks in the posterior uh, mandible. I need it in the anterior mandible. And I said, why, why you need a block in the anterior mandible? There are tooth and teeth inside. So probably you sent me the wrong scan. So, but this wasn't the case. So when we look into this case, this is a patient. And you can see a um, patient under orthodontic treatment. So the, the exercise here, and I was also very surprised was uh, to design a block for the anterior mandible. And I'll show you the, the design block here, the contour, the yellow contour here, to, to um, rebuild the missing hard tissue here because the teeth are almost not, uh, uh, do not have a buckle bone plate here. And to allow a little bit more orthodontic uh, movement of the teeth. So, I was surprised that such technologies exist, but basically those are um, cases we, we did a lot now with the group here. I cited the paper from Professor Gedwana and Professor Dominiak, um, and they published this uh, kind of technique, and this is how it looks like. So um, you can see here the, the, the braces or orthodontic splints on the teeth. So what we did here, we just grafted um, the bone Buckley. Um, sorry for the very, very poor quality, but this was the only picture I, I, I found in the published article. And this is how it looks like. So the block will be placed, um, um, Buckley will be fixed, and after a couple of weeks healing time only, they start to move the teeth um, with the braces into this newly, formed, at this time not newly formed bone, but at least in this new tissue. Um, which is now available. Very nice technology. And, and we did a, ma ma many cases um, also for this, uh, this um, indication. So I see a bit poor quality here. Maybe it's only my screen, but I mean, it's, it's not about the mandible again. It's not about posterior bone block. It's about the cyst. Hopefully you can see here at um, the, with the premolar, uh, the, the premolar here in the left mandible, there's a cyst. And the idea here was to um, identify, first of all, where is the cyst located. This is, can be easily done um, on the CT or Cobeam CT scan. Then uh, we designed the kind of cutting guide, a resection guide. So um, 3D printed um, polymer resection guide. So um, now you, you have probably an idea where to cut the bone to take out the cyst so we can prepare a window here which has been done and I just showed it to you on, a, on the on the virtual model so with the cutting template we have been able to assess the bone and the cyst to remove the cyst and later on since we know the volume here which is missing we designed the bone block which fit perfectly into this um, cavity and later on on the x-ray you can see the bone block has been stabilized with a, with a plate and with some screws. And it's also one of the special cases we did a couple of years back. So thanks to the um, um, Cone Beam CT technology and all the CAT CAM technology, uh, we can very uh, design very precise cutting templates, cutting uh, guides to assess also assists like that. Um, some comments about complications. Before we close um, the webinar, so first of all, we have limitations and complications. Limitations can be um, uh, in terms of data quality, comb, comb beam CT scan or um, a CT scan. So this is an example for good quality. So good means we can easily identify the bony surface and our, our automatic segmentation algorithm allows um, and detects the bone without any, any gaps or whatever. So it's very nice surface we can extract and the quality is good. Sometimes we're working the scan like that, which is super challenging. Um, you can have, you can see um, a very high contrast here. You can uh, easily identify the tooth and also the cortical bone structure. But then you go more to the, more to the posterior aspect here, and this is the maxilla scan. There's almost no bone, no sinus floor anymore, or even it's very thin. And then 
you do not really um, I mean, we can see it much better than our um, automatic segmentation algorithm can is detected. But this means for us a lot of work you can see what's happening when you just start automatic detection of the surface. You also detect the, the soft tissue. So this means for us a lot of work in, in cleaning uh, the, the SDL file. So we go slice by slice, which is sometimes really a hard work to, um, to precisely um, identify the bone. Um, some more limitations also, I mean, design limitations. It's again a bone block um, for uh, the mandible here on the right side. You see the buckle, the buckle aspect, and then we have a very thin layer of or thin yeah, layer of vertical component, and then going to the lingual. So this is very thin, a 0 0.26 millimeter. And then we plant the block and during the milling process, then we might have the problem and you can see it here. Um, because the cancellous bone, we have a porosity, poor size diameter, roughly 350 to 500 microns. So once we design um, a, a block which is thinner than 0 0.5 millimeter, so there's a high risk that during the manufacturing, the bone block will fracture. And also it's pretty hard to fix it. Uh, later on during the surgery. So what I'm always recommending here to um, overbuild a little bit just to, to have the safety that during the milling we do not um, the, the block bone fracture and we, we have uh, two or more parts um, after the milling process and once you place the block in at the defect site you are always having the opportunity to chance the option to reduce with a, with a burr or a piece of device um, the, the bone, which is probably not needed or overbuilt. So this is a technical limitation we also need to check during the design. Um, complications in terms of um, um, wound healing events or adverse events during the, the healing time. This is the case you can see we designed two blocks um, to increase the vertical aspect slightly, but mostly the horizontal aspect. Um, so the surgery went very well, the blocks fit very well, at least I, I tell you, just to save time. Um, but the problem was here, the, the provisional uh, prosthesis. So, I mean, a dentalist patient, and you always have the challenge after a couple of weeks, patient for sure um, request, um, wants to have a prosthesis. So what we saw after six months drafting, a DE stand on the upper right, and a D stand probably closed on the upper left. And just stay focused here on the upper right. So after a re-entry and elevating the flap, first of all, what, what we saw is very nice integration. Again, here the, the screws in tight contact with the bone blocks and no resorption. We have a high, we see a high vascularity and a very good integration of the bone blocks going to the more distal aspect here on the right maxilla. You probably see it how it looks like. It's not like the, the bleeding vital bone in the more anterior um, area. It's, it looks um, not so nice and it was a, a sequestration. And this was exactly the area where we, where we saw the dehiscence and, and just caused by the, by the prosthesis. So, I mean, the surgeon at this time um, was able just to remove the um, non-integrated part of the block. Um, lucky enough, we did not lose um, the full entire block graft. So finally, um, four implants have been placed. The initial planning was to place six implants, but you can see here um, on the first, second molar aspect and the right maxilla, there's almost no bone because that was the, the heat sense. And, and we lost um, part of the bone block but the remaining or, or very well integrated bone blocks have been able to um, have been able to um, be implanted now with, with some implants. Um, this is how it looks like on the X-ray, but this is a complication we need to have in mind. So as as soon as we see a kind of dehiscence, this is also a risk for um, those bone blocks. So they are not performing better. Uh, than autogenous blocks or other bone grafting materials. So dehiscence is always a risk. And I show you one more case um, 
this uh, a total failure. It's a block in the upper right maxilla. Um, not as much um, vertical aspect we designed here, but most of the block has been designed to, to gain um, a bone horizontally. Um, this is how it looked after surgery. You can see this huge flap and the flap looks also very nice. I mean, we can now discuss about um, uh, about vascularity and things like that. Anyhow, the um, patient came back after a couple of uh, weeks with, with this um, huge descent. And you can also see how the block surface looks like. I mean, totally, um, totally in, in, infected and not very healthy. So this was a, a, a total failure. So just remove the block in this case and let it here. And hopefully um, the patient is uh, getting back, coming back for, for a second try, whichever technique will be used um, for the second try. Um, key factors when you're talking about customized, not only bone blocks, Probably this is, so those are key factors for all grafting um, techniques, especially um, customized meshes or also bone blocks. So it's patient selection um, and biological limitations. I mean, you cannot grow bone 10, 12 millimeters vertically. There are always limitations. Um, then you have dense cortical bone. Then we also need to talk about uh, blood supply. Where's the vascularity coming from. So, I mean, we need to need to have in mind those biological limitations. CP, CT, cone beam CT, imaging is also a key factor. It's better the quality, as much better the fit of the bone block. Um, I'm not saying there are only a handful of devices we, we, um, we accept. So we work with all of the DICOM files we receive, but for sure there are some with better and some with uh, not so good quality. Soft tissue management, so again, since I'm not a surgeon, I'm not talking a lot about that, but we know articles from Romanos, from Dr. Ronda, from Eastern Urban. We can go back to the 90s, um, Professor Senior from Italy, who was used to work with PTFE reinforced membranes and described a nice um, soft tissue management techniques, flap elevation techniques, just I recommend to read um, some of the articles cited here. Six months healing time, this is important and this is also supported by um, evidence, by research. So this is very well known that allograft blocks are much slower in terms of remodeling compared to a touchiness bone. For a touchiness bone, we normally go in after four months because we have this high, sometimes high resorption rate, losing volume after four or six months healing time for a touchiness bone blocks up to 40%. This is what we at least do not see with the allograft block, with this particular allograft material, which is also linked and uh, to the processing. So it might happen that allograft from other tissue banks show totally different mechanical properties and also um, showing more or less resorption during healing time. So not all allograft materials are the same. And then finally, once we place the block and run the once we achieve the primary and tension-free closure, then we should also think about uh, the provisional prosthesis and dentures to avoid any pressure um, on bone block for at least a couple of weeks. I mean, best case would be six months. Do not have any pressure for six months on the bone block. Then it's not possible, then at least for four to six weeks. Um, I'm done. I'm finishing with a couple of references. There are many more available. This may be not the most recent update um, I, I have here, but there are more articles available and there are more and more articles coming because, again, there are more market players than just um, the, the Zimmer Biomed company. So thank you for your attention. There are a lot of traffic here in the chat, so maybe there's some yeah. time for, for questions. Yeah, uh, I am. Uh, first, I want to tell you, it's the first time I never saw uh, a graft being milled so thin as this one. This means that uh, the treatment that uh, the bones means your system to the plus, no, your certified way for uh, treating this kind of bone. It's very good because 
you you still have some elasticity that allows to do these uh, thinner parts on the milling, uh, which for me was was really amazing. And uh, you know that I have uh, some experience on milling bone blocks, mini synthetic bone blocks, and uh, the thickness is always a problem. We can never get these um, areas um, uh, surrounding the, the 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 bone block that could go so thin and could help so much on the adaptation of the the bone graft. So congratulations for that. Um, Thank you. Another much. thing, uh, there were some people asking here uh, if it is a protocol to cover all this uh, with membrane. This is at least what the what the um, research is telling us. Then you look into the allograft literature, and I'm talking now in general, not only about uh, this particular product I showed you. But when you look into the literature, then there's evidence that once a bone block, an allograft block, has been covered with a collagen membrane, then you have less shrinkage during healing time. So, and for me, this is strong evidence. Cover it with a membrane, and then you have you can control much better the shrinkage. Okay, and I think another thing I was very impressed with, for us who have some experience on bone grafting, uh, we always uh, use uh, as a tool to measure the screws, and the screws was always inside the bone when we do the re-entry, which is a very good aspect of this, meaning that this works very well uh for sure um uh there was a question from uh, abdullah about the screws do you also supply these screws with the bone or do they have to use those systems another thing do they have they are already planned on the um, with the, along with the with the bone graft you say already which is the length that you they should have no, and uh, this is what we are not doing. So, I mean, you are one step ahead. You are planning the position of the screws. We are not doing it um, because we are just lacking information about, you know, patient anatomy, how how wide the mouth can be opened, and things like that. We do not know um, how good we can access the surgical site. That's why we are not planning uh, the, board, the the screw position. The screws itself are no special screws, so you can use all the systems which are in the market. So we can measure for sure, based on the CT scan we have and uh, on the design block, we can measure the screw length, we can make recommendations, but we do not um, have a special system to fix the bone block. Okay, and I think this covers all uh, for uh, the questions that we have it here. Uh, sorry, another question. question. I saw one question regarding uh, better PCB bone blocks. Have you seen it? Um, ah, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, I, I know, I mean, there's, there was this company also, maybe there are more companies, but I remember also an article from the Curazan company in Germany. So they are, they are able to, to mill synthetic bone blocks. The, the problem are the mechanical properties. So it's very hard to fix such bone blocks um, because it's just mineral, it's brittle, and it's very high risk um, um, of fracture once you try to fix a just 100% mineral bone block um, with a screw. So from a technical point of view, you can mill it, but you have much bigger problems to fix it. And I know your PhD was on synthetic uh, uh, synthetic graphs, so. So uh, yeah, I also right. have some experience on that, and uh, we know that uh, we can achieve very large porosity, but the interconnectivity is always a problem, not more than eight yeah. microns or something. It's, it yeah. doesn't, it is not enough for uh, blood supply. That's true. That's true. That's the challenge with the synthetic products. They are normally, and normally not porous. So you need technologies to bring the pore structure inside, and this is yeah. this is the next thing. You know, it's not not so not so easy. Yeah. 
Okay, there was a question here, uh, sorry that we have passed it. Do the final quality of the bone graft are less aggressive implants recommended? Uh, Meaning this is by the way my <laughs> this is by, by the way my, my my colleague, you know, who is asking this question. But uh, this is a good <laughs> question. I I, <laughs> I know cases um when bone block has been placed and they let the bone block heal for only four months and then because it's 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 still a soft bone and also after six months it's soft bone. But at this particular case a noble active implant has been placed which was not a good uh, a good decision because they also emphasized a little bit the osteotomy to increase the uh, primary stability but after four months healing time the bone block was not very well integrated so once they placed the implants just uh, separated the, the block again yeah yeah okay i think the opposite because the aggressive implant was also uh yeah it's bernardo yeah uh, yeah, but it, 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 it's it's fair. Yeah, I I agree. It depends. I mean, when once you graft only horizontally and then you place an implant in between the block and the and the host bone, it's maybe maybe yeah challenging. When you do it vertically, okay, you can have a adaptation of the the bone block to the bony bed just because of the implant. Uh, another thing that I saw on the on the pictures. Uh, no one does decorticalizations, no, about on the before they place the uh, the bone graft. Um, at least I didn't I didn't show it here in my presentation. This is also very very interesting point when you look into the, the literature. Do we need to decorticate the bone or not? Um, and I did. Many years back, I looked into PubMed, and when you look into the results, it's quite not clear. I mean, um, there's not a clear recommendation to to remove the cortical bone or have some bleeding points. What you see is um, in animal studies that when you compare a site with bleeding points and without bleeding points, that after the first weeks of healing, I think it was after four, six, and up to eight weeks, the the site um, where the bone has been decorticated shows more bone formation um, up to eight weeks uh, post-surgery but once you re-enter after four months what we normally do for yeah. touching at bone blocks then it's the same so there, there seems to be an initial initial advantage in the first eight weeks but later on this um, this has no any any impact anymore and this is what what we found also in the in the animal studies okay Okay, Stefan, great presentation. Uh, I'll, sorry, just one. Uh, on your presentation, you put implants after six months, but what if, yeah. uh, oh, if you have, uh, it, it has, we have saw astrological studies on the beginning. Um, we have, I sh shared the, the histology, but yeah, we have also yeah. published articles. Also, somebody is interested in, in more evidence, I'm, I'm more than happy to, to share it. Uh, and also, this question to Joanna. Um, Stefan also shows some follow ups with one year with the CT scans, where the, it seems very stable what we have saw. Uh, it seems no big resorption, no important resorption. Resorption can always occur. It's not, we cannot even call it resorption. I think we should call it uh, readaptation or, or something. But of course, it is resorption, but sometimes because um, it's remodelation, I think. Another question nice with Jay's shape. Nice question, you. Oh, yeah, I how hard to build a customized uh, graph grown. Yeah, you saw some J-shaped uh, graphs. Yeah. Uh, is it problem. difficult? That depends on the thickness of both sides, no? Yeah, of both sides, but normally we can do it. I mean, the, 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 the shape, the J-shape is not a challenge. It's the thickness of the graph. Once we have a, we, we, we always, when we design the block, we want to have at least one millimeter thickness because then we are on the safe side. 
we can we can more or less um, mill everything also a, a geograph also the question of prgf uh if there's people who used to soak it on it uh do you have do you know cases mm, i know cases that people do it and did it and clinicians did it um it's also not contraindicated i mean the, the main question here is what we want to achieve with the prgf we know for the soft tissue healing it's very good um so prgf and soft tissue um is a very good uh, very good result uh, we already know for the bone healing bone formation is it maybe do we have maybe more bone formation than the bone block has been sorted with prgf there are no data available i i can't tell you if it's you know accelerating the bone formation or not When you look a little bit um, into the literature comparing particulate materials soaked with PRGF and not soaked with PRGF and put it in the sinus after six months heating time, there's almost no difference. Um, I think it's good to use, especially for the soft tissue, for the bone, you probably don't need it. Of course. Uh, I, I think Abdullah is from Middle East. Uh, in Middle East, where can, where, is it available or no? You are from EMEA, so... You shouldn't know it. Which countries they can? I, I, also, I, I no no no. I know it. So uh, Middle East is also a huge area. So when we talk about Saudi, when we talk about um, Dubai, when we talk about um, okay Dubai, Saudi, yeah, Saudi, okay Saudi, yeah, then Saudi we can do it. Yeah. No, uh, 3D printed blocks is not a question here because uh, it's not printing. <laughs> it's about using um, human bone to to mill it so it, it is possible to buy it in saudi yeah we have a distributor in saudi um okay. probably we need to check the license but the, the, at least they have the license to import the allograph um yeah we, we can talk about it this is not a limitation saudi should be working Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, very, very impressive what, with what I see. And really, I have to thank you for this presentation. It was very good to all of us. And we learned a lot today. Thank you very much, um, Rui, for this um, yeah, opportunity and possibility to present at this time in your, in your private chat. So this was very nice. Thank you much. And stay in touch. Okay. Thank you and goodbye. Goodbye, everybody. It was my pleasure. Goodbye. Okay. Thank you. You bye.